The message today is Jesus is God busy with saving the lost. The first, uh, the first message of our series we will preach in series is about salvation. Yeah, thank you for the lights. I feel much more comfortable when I can see you guys. Yeah, there you go. Praise God for the lights. And God said, let there be light. <laughs> yeah, so we will, we will preach in a series of messages. So we'll be four teams rotating. Our first one will be on salvation. Our second one will be on apologetics, giving a reason for our faith. The third one will be God empowering us with his Holy Spirit. And the fourth one will be God has a calling for us, for everyone. Amen. So our first one is on salvation. And as I was praying, uh, God, like which passage I can read and preach on salvation? I was seeking God in prayer. I was um, looking for which verse I would read because the whole Bible is about salvation. I was just looking for the one, you know, and God led me to this one. This miracle or this encounter of Jesus is uh, reported in three, three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The one I will read today is in Luke chapter 8, verse 28. You can open your Bibles. As you open the Bible, I want to make a note. My pastor from Brazil is here, Pastor Claudio. Estou muito contente que o senhor está aqui. Just a quick note, uh, I was serving in the church in Brazil, and as I was serving in the church, involved, people would come up to me and say, like, ah, you'll be a pastor, you should get training, like, to be a pastor. And I was engaged with automation and other stuff, I was like, ah, I don't want to be a pastor, I don't want to be a pastor. And then this pastor came along, <laughs> and he moved to our church, and he was pastor for about a year and a half. And we were, I remember we were having a conversation in his office. And then I told him, if it's to be a pastor like you are, then I want to be a pastor. <laughs> so praise the Lord. God moves in people, right? So the verse we read together is Luke 8, 28. And the verse says, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? And with this verse, I want to share a little bit about the story behind. So Jesus was in one side of the lake of this Sea of Galilee. And he was ministering to a crowd. He was ministry, ministering to a group of people. A lot of people have been healed. A lot of people were uh, ministered to. There are a lot of people curious to hear what Jesus had to say. And when he had this, let's say, good group of people, good uh, crowd, he decided to cross to the other side of the lake. So from our perspective, from our perspective, is like, you just have the perfect crowd. Why we're we moving to the other side? So maybe in the disciples' mind, they were like, oh, maybe there is even a better crown on the other side of the lake. Right? And I love the word the next, in the next slide. Jesus says, let's cross. Every time I hear cross, every time I read the Bible, every story I read in the Bible, I believe it's pointing to Jesus. It is pointing to the cross. It is pointing to salvation. So they decide to cross the lake to the other side. Once they get on the other side of the lake, when Jesus is tapped, his food on land. It happens the, the verse that we just read together. This demon possessed man. Runs towards Jesus. He falls on his knees. He bounds before Jesus. And he says that. What have I to do with you Jesus. Son of the most high God. And they have a dialogue. Jesus asks his name. Towards what the man answers. My name is Legion. Which refers to a Roman unit of, uh, of counting. Means like 6,000 soldiers. Which means that there were a lot of demons inside that man. Tormenting that man. And once they're having that dialogue. One thing that we see very clear. 
is that the demons are terrified of, the, of hell. They're asking Jesus, like, is it today the day of judgment? Am I done? Is it, is it gone? And Jesus doesn't answer this way, but Jesus allows them to go from the man to a herd of pigs. Once the demons enter in the pigs, the pigs run and throw themselves in the lake, in the sea, and they all die. When this happens, there were uh, shepherds that were taking care of the pigs. They get terrified. They get like, what's going on? So they run back to the towns around and they gather a group of people, a mob, and they come back and everyone is terrified of Jesus. And they expel Jesus from the land. The Bible says that they are terrified of Jesus and they don't let Jesus talk much and they like, please leave, get away, like go to the other side, like go back to wherever you came from. And they, they push Jesus out of, out of their land into the boat to the other side. Once they're doing this, the man that was once lost and naked, hurt, mad in his mind, they find in his right mind, clothed and talking with Jesus. So this man asked Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to go with you. And Jesus turns to him and said, no, you go back to the town where you came from. Go back to the people that knew you and tell them about the goods that God has done to you. So that's the story. Ended there. Now, why, why do I like this passage so much to talk about salvation? Because it, it's very clear for us that Jesus is saving us today and he's saving us tomorrow. He's saving us right now from our current state of sin and bondage. And he's also saving us for our eternal life. This is very clear in this picture. Because for the man that Jesus just healed, he's saved. Jesus changed his life right there. But sometimes we don't remember or sometimes we can't really picture that we are eternal beings that we have an eternal soul inside of us and we don't understand what is coming for us in eternity and what is nice about this passage is that the demons know and they are terrified of it you understand so let's go home today if you go home today with just one thing in your mind remember jesus is saving me today and Jesus is saving me tomorrow. He is saving me right now. And he is giving me eternal life with God. Amen? Are you guys following? So that's the story. And within, within this story, I want to highlight some things that God, like just my heart just got warm about the thoughts, you know. And the first one is that Jesus is not ashamed of our shame and more than that he's not afraid of our shame when the bible pictures this man and i think that's the very reason why jesus crossed the lake for one man is the man was naked he was mad he was completely out of his mind he was hurt because the bible says that he used to cut himself and the Bible also describes that the group of people, the cities around that region, they got together at some point and they put him in chains, in metal chains, to contain him. And that was not enough because he would break the chains and break loose from the chains and he would just torment that region. And I don't know if you have the same mind as me, but when I read the Bible this way, I can't stop like picturing, you know, the scene. I can't stop picturing like what really happened. And maybe we avoid because it's a weird thing to think about. But if we go to the reality of what happened that day, imagine this. A man, naked, long hair, you know, like dirt, cut, hurt, just runs towards Jesus. Towards Jesus. The son of the most high God. Jesus, the son of God. The only one. The one that has no blame in himself. That has no sin in himself. 
And I think this is such a beautiful picture because a lot of times, us, with our sin, we imagine Jesus as this holy being, you know, blameless, clothed in righteousness. And we think like, I will not open my heart to, to God this way. Like, I cannot expose my shame to him this way. And we think he's this God that is far away, that is not able to, to reach out his arm and grab us. You know what I mean? And we are right about that. God is holy. Jesus is holy. He is blameless. You know, he's spotless, perfect. The holy beings in heaven just bowed down before him and said, You are the only one worthy of worship. But at the same time, he's God with us. He's Jesus Emmanuel. He's the one that has been promised to us. And he was, he's the one that decides to cross, you know, from one side to the other side of the lake because of one man. Not because of one good man. Because of one lost man. And the reason why I think Jesus crossed the lake for that man is because he was painting a picture saying, look, if I can save this one, there's no challenge big enough for my grace, for my love, and for my restoration. Amen? He was saying, like, I want to make something clear for everyone. I want to register something in the Bible that they will be reading down in Renton, Life of Victory. One day, they will find out that even if I am Holy, blameless, the Son of God. I am busy with saving the lost. I am able to save the lost. So what do I do with that? What does it mean at, at practical days, you know? It means that we need to bow down before Jesus and say, Jesus, look, I want you to be Lord of my marriage. I know that you're holy. I know that you have better plans to me. I know that your ways are much higher than where I am today. And if I, sh if I would tell you the truth, I am ashamed of, of my shame. You know what I mean? But I want you to be holy. I want you to be holy in my marriage. I want to bring your lordship into my house. See, Jesus, maybe nobody knows, but... I do this when nobody is looking. I drink here. I do that. You're not really Lord in my mouth, you know. Sometimes my tongue breaks loose. And we think, we tend to think that church, you know, a bunch of holy people. We sing like songs for God. And we think that God would not cross a lake to find me. <laughs> And we are very wrong about that. Because this is our Jesus. He is the one that would cross for one man. He, would, he is the one that would cross for one woman. He thinks it is worth it to do the trip. <laughs> he, sing, he thinks it's worth it to go all the way for that one person, for that one man. And if we ask his lordship to be lord over our lives, he will set us free. And he will change our lives. And he will cloth our shame. Amen? He will rescue us. Because that's the very intent of his heart. So Jesus is saving me today. I need to bow down before him and say, God, I need you right now. I need you today. I need you in my finances. I need you in the company where I work. I need you in my marriage. I need you in the way you talk. I talk with my kids. I need you among my friends. I need you right now. I need you today. And even though if there is shame on that, I still want you. I still know that you are not far away from me. I still know. I, I mean, I know that you are willing to cross and, and come. So please, come. So that's the first thing. The second thing is Jesus is saving us tomorrow. And what I like about this passage too, I wish... I wish I knew it before, uh, or I wish I had like this thought ready before, because sometimes when I minister or when I preach to people that don't believe God, don't believe in God, like atheists, 
or people that don't respect Christianity, they will often say to me, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell. All my friends will be there. Have you ever heard that? That you're talking to somebody and they'll be like, oh, no, yeah, yeah, I know, but I don't want to go to hell. Like, I think I, I think I team better with Satan's team. And when I hear that, I'm like, man, you have no idea what you're talking about. But I didn't remember this passage. So when, whenever this conversation comes back, I would be able to say, you know that Satan is terrified of hell? You have the wrong mindset. Because often we think, oh, okay, yeah, Jesus is king in hell, uh, in heaven. He has a throne over there. He's ruling over celestial beings. Therefore, Satan is king in hell and he has a throne in hell. We have the tendency to think this way. But this is wrong. This is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus is king in heaven and God has created hell for Satan and his rebellious demons to be tormented for eternity. So Satan is not king in hell. Satan is king of nothing. He's homeless. His, his uh, judgment day is appointed and his time is ticking. So what happened here is not because Jesus didn't send them to hell now because we are very privileged. We are not in the time of judgment. Now we are in the window and the time for salvation. So what God is saying like, now I have a set time for saving the lost. Whenever this time is due, Satan knows better than us his eternal destination. So next time I come across this conversation, I'll be like, man, you're very wrong. The one that you claim you will be following is terrified of hell. He's afraid of that. He knows what's coming. So you should come back to your right mind or stop talking nonsense and be afraid of your eternal destination too. And what Jesus does for us, he changes our eternal destination from judgment to salvation amen I, I like that i really like that and now i'm i'm looking forward for this conversation again because i know it will come you know <laughs> i've heard many times and i know it will come i know that there are people out there that they don't fully understand the precious eternity amen so with that said, and then I was, I was, reading, I was writing uh, this down, another thought came to my mind. And I was like, wow, God is actually inviting me to eternity with Him. How much does He love me? Because <laughs> right when I was finishing that, a friend that came to visit us, that is dear to us, was just leaving. And you know when you pass the whole weekend with a friend you're very happy to see him when he comes you know like oh kids play around you're like Woohoo, nice that you're here let's do something let's eat and then when they're about to leave like a day or two like oh good that you're gone man see you next year <laughs> it just changes your routine you know what i mean and it's a dear friend like i know him for years and in brazil i moved uh when when we went to brazil i moved just to be neighbors with my brother so he was apartment 101 and I was 102, just like door neighbors. And at the first, it was really nice. And then within like a few months, like, okay, we need to set some boundaries, you know. Whatever sugar is in my shelf is my sugar. <laughs> Whatever sugar is in your shelf is your sugar. Let's, let's start there, you know. Like, you see the door? There's a door for my home, a door for your home, you know. So, because... And then when I was thinking, I was like, I don't know if I would invite my brother in eternity, you know, to be in eternity with me. And it's, of course I love him, of course I would. It's just, I want to picture this. Do you understand? And then whenever we think about God's invitation to us, like, wow, how much does he love me? Because he invited me to his home not for a weekend, you know, not like to go to five guys together, eat some fries, and then like, yeah, you take off, you know, like, go back to your life, I will 
keep my life on this side. God is inviting us to be in eternity with Him in a relationship. So the love of God for us, I think, we cannot comprehend. We cannot understand how much does He trust us to open this invitation and say like, Hey, if you listen to me, if you ask for salvation, if you stretch out your arm, I can grab you and I can bring you into my home, into this eternal relationship. And you have no idea who you will be once you open the door. I'm about to change everything. I'm about to change shame into glory. I'm about to take your naked and, and cloth it, you know. I'm about to take a hurtful heart, a hurted heart, and make it perfect and heal it. So we can live together. Isn't it amazing? That's amazing. And that's the love of God for us. And that's the salvation invitation. That's what Jesus is calling us to. And I like this picture because, I like this passage because the picture it paints, it's amazing. Jesus is saving me today and he's saving me tomorrow. He's about to change my life now and he has a beautiful thing for eternity for me. Amen? I love that. So we're... Wrapping up our service, I want to invite the worship team to come up. And with, with this passage, with these uh, concepts that we talked today, I want you to go home with, with these very specific ideas, very clear ideas in your heart. And if we can say homework, I want you to go home with a homework. <laughs> we need to be intentional at bowing down before Jesus and asking His Lordship to come over our lives. We need to be very intentional about that. So as we walk this week, as we do our lives this week, as we go to work, as we talk to our children, as we talk to our spouses, our families, as we prepare our meals, you know, as we just do life, as we drive around in traffic, we need to be intentional in saying like, Hey Jesus, I just heard Sunday that you saved a very lost man. I'm not that far yet. <laughs> You know, but I think you can be Lord over this area of my life. And I'm saying this like I'm Christian for many years. My pastor is here. Like I still have areas in my life where I need to be intentional and say like, Jesus, come be Lord over this area. Be Lord over here. You're welcome here. We need this salvation to be renewed in our hearts. So the hope, you know, the restoration, the healing will be always fresh in us. Amen? Always fresh in us. And we need to understand this. That he's, he wants to be busy with that. He's a God that is close to us. Not far from us. Amen? And the second thing that is also very important. The demons in this picture just show us the future that we have. Satan is defeated. He's done. It's done. So with this type of heart, we can go towards our life with a joyful heart. With the heart saying like, yeah, I am victorious, you know. I'm in the right team. I'm with the right God. I'm serving the right Lord. So everything I do, I need to be victorious. I need to have a happy heart. Full of joy, full of hope. Because God has invited me. I said yes. He's Lord over my family. He's Lord over my marriage. He's Lord over my kids. He's Lord over my company. Satan has no business with me. He's defeated far away from me. And my eternity in God with Him is victorious. Who has this type of heart and walks around like, ah, oh, man, you know what? You know? So if we let God fill our heart with this hope, it will change our lives. And this type of heart doesn't cross the lost and say like, you know, whatever. Like, deal with your problems. I have something else. This type of heart 
knows like, man, I just serve a Lord that you have no idea what he's able to do. I just serve a Lord that if, if you give me a chance, I will share with you. He has hope for you today and tomorrow. Jesus has changed me. I need to, I need to say something. Jesus has changed me today and he can change you too. Imagine this man going back to his town. We'll revisit this passage maybe in three Sundays from now when we talk about the calling of God. Because he returns, he returns to his town and next time Jesus comes around, those cities, they gather a multitude of people and they start bringing like people for Jesus to heal and to minister to. It's very interesting. Next time Jesus goes away, they are afraid of Jesus. Next time Jesus comes around, there's a group of people like, we are waiting for you. You know why? Because the man that they knew was totally different. It was a new person. So what I want to see in my life, what I want people to see in your life is, man, I knew you. Who are you? What's going on? You know? I want neighbors to visit like, how was it? I was with dinner with you like like six months ago whose house is this what happened with you guys you know what I mean and the only thing in between that is Jesus Christ the only way to to do that is if we let Jesus cross from one side into our side of the lake you know what I mean that's what we need so we go home today and we want to be intentional, saying, God, please be Lord over me. Be Lord over me. I'm not ashamed anymore. You know what? There are things that I want you to change. There are things that I need you to change. And we need to understand that God is busy with doing that change. Amen.